Good evening, colleagues, friends, families, and Cedar Rapids Community School District committed community members. Thank you, thank you for being here tonight. Um, we're so appreciative of uh, you joining us this evening. And uh, we have um, a plan for discussion tonight. The purpose of tonight is to give an update of our facility master plan. Uh, some data that we've collected in consideration of uh, boundaries and consideration of boundaries for our west side projects mm -hmm. and to more importantly get and gather your input and your feedback in regards to um, boundary recommendations. And so um, our greatest hope tonight is to facilitate absolutely get some information to you, but then facilitate um, questions and uh, feedback um, that we'd like to get from you as well. So what I would like to do is just invite you at this point in time to just some orientation of how we'll use Zoom this evening. I will be um, sharing a slide deck with you and uh, we'll go through some content together. But I would also invite you, if you could look at the bottom of your screen, you will see uh, the chat button, um, which will open up the chat page on the side of the screen for you. And uh, you can see I've already written a comment, a welcoming comment to everyone. I am also going to um, include in that chat at the end of our discussion tonight, um, a feedback survey uh, where we're going to actually ask and, and gather your input and some data on the discussion this evening. But feel free throughout the discussion tonight to add your questions, comments, ideas into the chat. And then our team, who's here tonight from the district, uh, will be welcoming uh, the answers to the questions um, and engaging in that, um, in your questions. So what I would ask that uh, we do at this point in time, uh, district level administrators and principals who are with us tonight, if you wouldn't mind taking your video off, if you are able to, and um, I am just gonna ask that you introduce yourselves. And what I'm gonna do is uh, play a little, um, oh, we're gonna play a little ball. That was my uh, Sweet Caroline. Those of you who are baseball fans and like to go to see uh, games, that is definitely a engaging baseball game uh, song. And I'm gonna throw the ball to um, a district leader to introduce themselves. And when you get the ball, please just state your name and uh, your position in the district and then get through all of our leaders we'll start the engaging conversation. Okay, so I'm gonna throw the ball to Scott Wing. Thanks, Doreen. I'm Scott Wing. I'm the transportation manager for the district. And throwing the ball over to Dave Nicholson. Good evening, everybody. I'm David Nicholson. I'm the executive director of business services for the district. And I'm gonna throw the ball to Eric Christensen. Thank you, Dave. Good evening, everyone. I'm Eric Christensen, and I'm the Executive Director of Elementary Education. And I will throw the ball over to Angela Billman. Hi, everyone. I'm Angela Billman. I'm a data analyst at the Cedar Rapids School District. I'm going to pass the ball to Tammy Kuba. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tammy Kuba. I'm the principal at Truman Elementary, and I will throw the ball to Greg O'Connell. Good evening, everyone. I'm Gregory O'Connell. I'm the current principal at Coolidge Elementary. And, and Greg, I'm going to pass the ball back to me. I think. Oh, back to Noreen. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, did we miss any district uh, leaders or administrators who can assist this evening? Great. Okay. Thank you. And thanks for being here tonight. Uh, and also we have staff members here tonight as well. And certainly um, feel free staff members, you know, this work as well to um, assist with questions. So again, thank you for being here at this point in time. What I'm going to do is share my screen and um, I would ask that our team members, um, administrators and leaders, if you would keep your eye on the chat, that would be great. Uh, Dave Nicholson has agreed to be a lead there and then uh, any other district administrators, if you could help call that to my attention, if questions come in, feel free to interrupt the conversation at any time and say, Noreen, could you stop and answer this question? Noreen, 
Maureen, I think you went on mute there. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, teammates, for keeping an eye on the chat. Um, and then just throw those questions out as we continue with our presentation. If I could just see a thumbs up, um, and you could give me just a physical thumbs up. I can see, perfect. Thanks for letting me know that you can see the screen. So here we are. Again, welcome to this evening. Our agenda tonight is uh, pretty simple. Um, complex issues behind each one of these, but certainly um, a, a simple agenda of our tasks tonight. One, we wanted to review with you a little bit of our history and also the guiding principles and the processes we've been using to gather our data and uh, make data-driven decisions around our boundary recommendations as we um, consider our boundaries for our elementary schools on the west side. Secondly, we're gonna review three boundary options and recommendations that have surfaced as a result of that data. And that is of course, considering the five elementaries uh, that exist within those boundaries. We would welcome feedback and questions on each one of those options. And also we are calling them options at this point in time. Had a couple questions from um, the session last night, which was a live session at Jefferson. That actually feedback might help us consider um, tweaking some of these options. So please do feel free to get, that's the purpose of this is to really get your input. And then uh, lastly, um, we really do want to, throughout the presentation, gather your feedback and questions, but we are going to ask that you take a survey at the end of this, uh, which is really um, feedback on each one of the options, as well as just open-ended feedback for us to consider um, uh, from your perspective, um, from the information tonight, or even information that you're still seeking after tonight. So again, uh, thanks for being here and we will start with the content. So we're gonna start with an overview. Marie, we have one question real quick. Yes. And the question is who will ultimately be making the boundary decisions and what role do the community members play? So the community members, of course here tonight and, um, and of course our broader community, um, their input is what we're gathering now. We're in the process of gathering input on some possibilities to consider our boundaries. That input is heavily weighted. We have to consider all everybody's voice and perspectives. Ultimately, we'll go over these guiding principles that are guiding our decisions. And really, ultimately, the decision does lie uh, with management to make a recommendation based on all the input that we've gathered. And then what we do is make a recommendation to the board. And um, so that will be in, uh, the administrators on the screen here at, are gonna take all that feedback, make the best recommendations um, based on the data and the guiding principles in order to make sure that we're serving all of our families and kids as best as possible. Great question, thank you for that. So we're gonna start with a high level overview of our facility master plan, uh, which is now of course uh, being implemented. And then uh, we're gonna have an overview of our current boundaries and what do our current boundaries look like for the elementary schools. So this is just a, an overview of our facility master plan. It's a really high level overview. And uh, what I'm gonna ask that you consider this overview is on a timeline perspective. Um, several years ago, uh, the district put together a facility master plan task force. Uh, this was um, uh, a couple year long process where a large group of constituents from throughout our community put together some analyses of what was happening within our districts with enrollment, with our facilities, and considering what would be the possibilities to really cast a future ready um, vision for our school district in regards to facilities. Um, all buildings, all levels were considered in that conversation, but over that two year timeline, uh, this particular, that particular team narrowed the scope to a recommendation based on all the data to an elementary focus. The big picture recommendation at the end um, that our board adopted this a facility master plan just over two years ago 
was a focus on the elementary schools. And that was to reduce the number of elementary schools in our school district from 21 to approximately 13. Not just from a numeric point of view, but from a services, collaboration, best practices point of view. What we know about education and what's evolved over time is we have moved from a practice of a lot of isolation and working in our classrooms to a practice of collaboration and sharing practices and studying together to deliver on the promise for children together. Some of our buildings have better opportunities for that than others at the elementary level. We have elementaries that range in scope from buildings of just over 200 children to buildings that are closer to um, 600. Uh, we have our largest building has just about 575 students enrolled in it. And so when you have that range, we get a lot of variance within our systems for opportunities uh, for collaboration amongst children as well as amongst uh, the practitioners. So the idea is not just to focus on um, one isolated building or one series of buildings, but rather cast a future ready vision that can allow for collaborative practices, um, environmental considerations, right. improvements on the physical spaces of our buildings, and then offer um, even a community lens of that our elementary schools become not just centers for our school district, but centers for our community. We have many of those practices already in place, but that's that's been the series of designs. So those principles have been put in place as we've considered these early projects. So when that team got the focus of elementary schools, they also studied which buildings and why would they make the recommendations where to, to start this project. The timeline above here, um, these three colored boxes are in tiers. And these tiers, please consider them over a 20 to 25 year timeline. This isn't something that's going to be done in, in four or five years. Tier one <clears throat> is to start. And the reason the committee landed on the west side was because of growth and enrollment as well as the condition of our buildings and so that allowed uh, for readiness to say all right where do we begin and the first place to begin was landed at the current site at coolidge so you all will know this. And then the second site was Jackson for all of these reasons, growth on the west side of population, um, also the possibilities of those specific sites having um, um, the possibility to build new buildings. We have land to do it. And then um, also the condition of those two buildings uh, needed some support. So that's why we started on the west side. The vision to get to um, these uh, the collaboration and the size of best practices uh, would also allow, and I'll just use an example, um, um, having been a principal in a smaller building, that's been part of my experience. It's really challenging when you have a grade level teacher, say at second grade, who's the only second grade teacher in the building who doesn't necessarily have a partner of shared practice within the building. <clears throat> Certainly we can scope across the district and have some shared conversations, but within the day, within the moment, you have that partner to share experiences with. So the idea is that the more collaboration we can have around a grade level, the greater opportunities of instruction we have for children. So when we look at the scope of the elementary plan, we also knew that meant that we would have to repurpose some of our buildings. So the first um, tier here, we're calling it tier one, phase one, because we knew that it would have to be done within a trilogy or more of schools. The first two sites here are for the new constructions. So all the names of the buildings on this particular timeline were the anticipated new construction sites on this 20 to 25 year timeline. We don't know for sure if these really will be all the future sites because we have to continue to analyze our enrollment data and assess our building needs and our community needs of uh, our population. So that will be ongoing ebb and flow. I think we've experienced that this year with the derecho. It impacted our community and certainly impacted our enrollment and certainly impacted where our families live. So we'll continue to analyze that over time, which is the intention of this little timeline here. 
So we're in this first tier one, phase one. If you come down to this part of the timeline, um, that unpacks, we know not just Coolidge and Jackson, but it also has a direct impact, as you all well know, Truman, which will be the first school to be repurposed uh, within this trilogy of schools. The pause on the timeline is to stop, reflect, how did this project go? How did these projects go? How did our boundary study go? And then consider where the next steps with enrollment demographics, as well as the condition of our buildings for the next project on the, on, on the scope. We will be starting that pause reflection work actually immediately this spring, because we're in the midst of our first um, series of schools. So just wanted to give you kind of a high level overview of the why again, as to where we are with the facility master plan. Noreen, uh, we yes. do have a question on yes. uh, about uh, Van Buren used to be listed in tier three, they believe, and uh, they don't see it now. And it's uh, what the, is Van Buren. So I admittedly, um, this is the documentation that um, I've been working from. However, I'd be glad to go back to the original documents of the uh, facility master plan and, and look at that. I think there was some original discussion around Van Buren. Um, uh, and, and also we've had some changes like literally within, since the facility master plan was adopted, again, why we have the pause on the plan, um, Van Buren's enrollment has increased in the past two years. Uh, so that is another consideration that we have to keep in mind. Exactly why we have to have these iterations of the pauses on the plan. So again, honestly, we can't really say if Arthur will be the next destination. We have to take a look at what's happening within our district. It's, um, it is iterative and we will have to determine where, where will the next um, series be for improvement across the district. Great question about Van Buren. I can go back and look at that, that data from the original facility master plan team. Thanks, Dave. So this is a picture of our current maps. And um, I will tell you, this is a laminated map and the marker scribbles on there are my handwriting. <laughs> and this just shows you um, uh, just part of the process of we were just, this is the initial gathering of data of like, where are we? What's our current state? So really just wanna overview for you is what the map looks like for our boundaries. So the red section up here is the boundaries for um, the current Jackson Elementary School. The pink section is the boundaries for the current Truman School. The blue boundaries are the current Coolidge. Gold is Van Buren and gray is Hoover. And then you can see we have these little tiny outlines in here. I'll explain those in a little bit. What we did is we looked at what's the total population in these current head counts just this year's enrollment at the beginning of the school year. This is very, very, very beginning of the school year. And started looking at, okay, this is good to know a total head count, but we thought, you know, we really need to break it down into what we call smaller maps of each one of our schools to better understand our total student head count, the populations, and, the to and what the boundary study um, might be able to surface uh, for possibilities. So that's just a picture of what our current boundaries are. Here's some of our guiding principles and actually um, our leadership team. And we also worked with our um, elementary staff members resulted in some immediate recommendations just based on the data that I think even any group would result in this um, in these recommendations, but then also the guiding principles we're using specifically for the elementary boundaries. As we looked at our high school and middle school um, enrollment data, uh, we could make some pretty clear determinations right away. Um, the current high school enrollment, Kennedy has our largest enrollment across the district at about a um, little better than 1800 students. And they have been pretty steady for a couple of years. They had a tiny little enrollment dip last school year. And then this year across our entire system, we've had enrollment dip, but that is due to um, pandemic concerns. So that um, Kennedy has been pretty steady for a while. Um, Jefferson has had a little bit of enrollment growth. 
Um, and they, we anticipate that continuing to happen because of the West Side growth. Jefferson's better than um, 1650 um, in their school. And then Wash, Washington High School is our smallest high school of enrollment of around 1500 students. So this, of course, boundary study impacts two of our high schools, that being Jefferson and Kennedy. And so because the anticipated growth for Jefferson at this point in time, it made sense that we keep the boundaries as they are. Kennedy is at 1800 and pretty full. Jefferson has some possibility for growth. And then if we leave the boundaries as they are, the current high school theaters would remain the same. So even if an elementary school shifts for a family in their current residence, the current high schools that they're designated to would remain the same. Middle schools, we are going to determine after we make the, the elementary school recommendations. A lot of um, research around this, um, not just enrollment headcount, not just the number of students that go within a building, but in addition to that, the cohort transition experience from fifth grade to sixth grade, um, we want to do our very best to support the social emotional uh, needs of our kids and that making sure that they can stay together as much as possible from a fifth grade to a sixth grade experience. So we wanna make sure that we're considering that as well uh, when we look at our boundary study recommendations. So middle schools will be on hold until we determine the elementaries. So elementary, here's the guiding principles. Our new build, buildings will be able to hold 600 students as a total population. Um, so we know that we wanna make sure that we've got a little room for growth in those. Um, over the next 10 years, it's anticipated the West Side has about 80, 80 students is what they anticipate with birth rate and what the enrollment patterns are and um, population study over a 10 to 15 year period. So it's not hundreds, it might be up to 100, but not, um, not a steep curve, So, which is nice for us because we can plan for it. Secondly is demographic balance potential and looking at how our buildings are balanced as much as possible. And then finally, this is a real deal, looking at traffic patterns and crossing main roads. And then if we change boundaries, we have to make sure there's transportation access for our kids to get safely to school. So those we have a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, one on the previous screen that talked about the numbers. They wanted to know if that included 100% virtual students, those numbers. This is an, a flat out enrollment, all kids. Yes. Yeah, this is just even, uh, and I'm not to say that we're going to pretend that virtual doesn't exist this year, but this is just the number of students that are attached to a building. So yes, it's all the, all the students that are designated to that building, even if they're in a virtual school. Great question. And the next question was, how will this affect Hoover's status as a community school? And what effect will this plan have on that process? It, the, the, we are committed to the community school. That process will continue. In fact, we are studying that process of looking at what that might look like throughout our district and other schools as an opportunity. So it will maintain as a community school. Great question. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks, Dave. So uh, what has the process been so far? Okay. Um, we reviewed all of our data points. Uh, we included um, a consultant who looks at enrollment population studies, birth rate, et cetera, and ongoing um, um, demographics of a community. Uh, secondly, we looked at our, we have an amazing transportation tool uh, and that you've met Scott Wing, our transportation director, who was able to uh, really drill down to every single household you could see on a data map. Um, there's visualizations for that. And we were able to really look at um, um, specific data down to individual households for um, the number of students within each one of our communities. And then we also took a look at our um, enrollment patterns um, in, in all of our elementary schools and what we're seeing happen over time, as well as um, students who are permitting from one elementary within our school school district to another um, elementary school, for example. Um, Angela Billman, if you wanna give a little wave, our data analyst was able to put a lot of those pieces together so that we could look at visualization tools in a very comprehensive way. So that was the first step. 
lot of data collection. Second step was to have um, discussions with our, our K through 12 administrators, um, including our high school administrators, middle school administrators, elementary administrators, um, uh, giving the scope of, of what this might look like from a big picture. They work directly with all of you, our families, and they were able to bring in a whole other um, set of questions. Qualitative data, I like to say, narrative feedback for us to consider um, as we move forward. Then we drilled down um, after we gathered all that data input, um, made some drafts, I guess you could say, of maps of potential boundaries. We had a lot of potent possibilities. And then we met individually with each of the five elementary principals who absolutely know their communities, families, um, and students about their perspectives and the stories of each one of our schools. And also um, our, our elementary principals who are managing these new building projects. So that was the next step, gathered more information. And then what we decided to do is present this very information you have tonight, we presented to the five elementary um, staff members. Um, and uh, we have um, this presentation, which will also go to um, our secondary schools to gather input from them as well. So got feedback from them and we've narrowed uh, uh, down to three options. And now we need input from you on where the ideas are and where the data landed. So we're gonna have some presentations of three options. Um, we recognize that this isn't just about data and numbers. Um, Hello. It's a real deal for our families. This is um, very emotional and um, we love you. We love that you have chosen us kids. And we love our staff members and our principals and everybody working in our district. No, no. Very um, emotional process uh, because we love our schools. And so even getting school on your site, um, there's some nostalgia that goes with the with the old school. And we want to make the emotion part of this as well. So um, we we do appreciate that and definitely want to listen to your concerns too. Ooh, I like them. So without like further ado, your... we're going to look at some options together um, and what and how we set those options up. Uh, BK Knight, you may want to turn off your mic. You're on. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate that. And uh, one other quick question, Noreen, is about yes. schools. If we probably, I, I'm assuming this is if we, one of the schools that might in the, on the, uh, uh, in the future, is a current magnet school, will the new school adopt the theme of that school, magnet school? So, um, uh, if, so currently Coolidge, um, nor Jackson, nor Truman are magnet schools. And so, but certainly if that would be an interest of a school to adopt a certain theme or um, idea, we want to support the vision of uh, the members of that school. So for example, Hoover is a community school, but that is not a magnet program, but it's certainly an innovative program. And um, uh, we certainly want to support the efforts at Hoover. So yes, it really takes a community um, and a vision together to think about what the possibilities are. So we absolutely would support um, whether it be a theme or an idea or something that drives the vision of a school, we encourage that. So yes. So this map in front of you um, is the same map I shared earlier. It probably just looks a little cleaner without my scribbles on it. Uh, but what it highlights is um, not just, and you can see the northern part here, this is Jackson, it's a little more orangey red in this picture, pink Truman, blue Coolidge, gold Van Buren, and gray Hoover. What we did is we broke down the maps, um, the boundaries into subsections. So we could see how many students are in that neighborhood, um, how many great, how many kids in a grade level are in that neighborhood. How would it be affected? Um, um, how would each um, school, new site school, be affected if we take just one portion of um, not the entire school? So we asked a lot of those kinds of questions. And so um, what we were able to do with our data is we can actually pull out each one of these subsections and tell you how many students are there, what grade levels they're in, what the demographics are of, um, of those students, 
and those in order to better understand how we would um, make decisions. So we just broke down each school into micro, we're calling them micro maps to better understand what the possibilities were. Oh, and one thing I should um, say is that I would be glad to, at, uh, once we finish the presentation, I'll put a copy of the slide deck. Um, I'll email a copy of the slide deck to everyone who was here tonight so that you can have a copy of this um, to take with you as well. I should have said that from the beginning. Oops. So just, oh, I want to back up one little piece here. This just want to use this as an example. This little section right here, you can see this is the boundary of Truman um, with the outline around it. And this little section right here is this south little tail on Truman boundary. And when you just look at this from a geography point of view or puzzle piece, it kind of makes sense if you were to say, what should go where? that this little neighborhood right here, it is just a hop, skip and a jump from the current site at Coolidge. If we were to just think about this from saying what's close in proximity to make decisions, that could be a question or a reason why we would make a decision. But I just wanna use this as an example of a micro map and the data that's in that micro map. So let's look at that 8C micro map. So you can see here, this is the 8C, um, that little section of the micro map. And this is the current data that represents the students in that neighborhood. We currently have four students, even though it's a Truman boundary, four of the students in that neighborhood currently attend Coolidge. Uh, one is a preschooler, one is in kindergarten, one is in second grade, and one is in fifth grade. Then we see that one student from that neighborhood actually attends the preschool program at Jackson. And then finally, we do have six students from the neighborhood who do attend Truman, their neighborhood school. So that is a total of 11 students. Now, granted, we have um, pro different programs sometimes in our schools, uh, which allows for um, access to something that's close by. So for example, if Truman doesn't have a preschool program, there's something close by where you could take your students to preschool. So that we realize that influences some of the numbers. But the reality is out of the 11 kids attending our schools in that neighborhood, six of them are Truman students. So that's the type of data that we're looking at to help us make um, some uh, recommendations and decisions. So here we go. This is option one. We're gonna look at this from a micro map point of view. And um, the data that you see on the left-hand side of the screen is just total student headcount. So I'll explain some of the um, headcount information. And then we would really invite um, questions as we go through these three options. And so thank you, Dave and others for managing the questions. So I'll explain the, um, the option. Uh, and a little think aloud here, and then we would invite your feedback or questions on this option. So if you come to the very north here, again, that orangey red um, color up here is the current Jackson site. And what we did is outlined in orange what the potential new site boundaries headed to Jackson site would be. Notice I keep saying Coolidge site and Jackson site. It's because we haven't named our new buildings yet. And under board policy, when we build a new building, we have the opportunity to name them. And the kids have been helping us with the initial ideas on that um, project. So the orange outline here tells you that this would be the recommendation of what of the families that would be headed to the North Jackson site. And the blue boundaries here would tell you the families that would be headed to the new Coolidge site. Um, I mentioned this earlier regarding the question of Van Buren. It's been interesting for us for the past couple of years. Um, our enrollment increases in our district have actually been the greatest at Hoover Elementary and Van Buren Elementary. We've had increase of enrollment to the point where they're having a hard time um, with space. And so this is coincidental, but it's happened here on the west side, which again is an iteration of um, us considering how to um, utilize our new resources. So 
If we look at these particular recommendations, this would then be at the top of the page here, the total headcount that would happen in the new sites. The current state shows you what the current numbers are in each one of those schools. So you can see how it would shift our numbers in our elementary schools, perhaps not to a significant degree, but certainly shifts the numbers. It also allows for some growth opportunity in our new schools. The one point I do want to make, and this will be on each one of the options, is this particular bullet point that says Truman permits. What this means is there's 124 students who currently are enrolled at Truman who do not live in the Truman boundary. And so although the population of Truman is better than, um, two, I think it's 260, Tammy, you can certainly correct me. I think we're right about there, 260. Um, that's that 124 students are permitted to Truman. So we would have to work individually with those families. What is their school of origin? And certainly give them an opportunity to consider a permit to one of the new schools, if that would be their choice, or perhaps they would prefer to return to their resident school. So here is, that is the first option. So in, in any feedback or questions, we would invite before I move to the next screen. Noreen, we have a, a one question here. Um, my backyard backs up to Van Buren. We actually share a fence. However, on the same street as my house, up a couple blocks is Prairie District. They are nowhere near Prairie and with Prairie becoming overpopulated, have you considered bringing this neighborhood into the Cedar Rapids School District? You know, this is what's, history is interesting. I, I learned things um, in history. So years and years ago, when those neighborhoods were started, um, I, I don't, I'm not sure who the forefathers were. I just know uh, through some um, documents that I was reading around boundary studies, it, Cedar Rapids was originally considering that, that purchase, uh, but didn't make it. And uh, Prairie said, sure, we'll do it. And so um, certainly that has impacted um, Cedar Rapids um, enrollment there on the Southwest side. I don't think college community wants to give up their students, but you bet I'll invite that conversation with um, delicately with our friends to the South. Um, and so um, you're, there is opportunity there um, for sure. And so um Yes, we would we'll take we would love all of our children in um, the Cedar Rapids metro area to change the boundaries. <laughs> we'll just get as big as we need to. We'll take that Linmar section up there that's the Cedar Rapids address as well. But um, great question. Thank you for that. And have another one here. Are you including all students that would attend the new sites in the naming project? Uh, so it, it has been um, the the what we did is created um, just an idea list and the three elementaries of Truman, Jackson and Coolidge generated the original um, idea list. Now we need to go to the next round. So now we have some ideas and we will be including all of our elementary um, students um, to participate in voting and even ideas that haven't been considered so far um, and um, getting feedback from them of what they would like. So we have a generated initial list that we would like to folks to vote on their, their thoughts. And if there's things that we haven't considered, we wanna invite that too. And then we're gonna invite it to the broader community. Um, all, the, all the school district staff members and community members. We wanna hear all voices on that. It's kind of a fun, um, a fun thing. And we need to accelerate that process because part of engineering and design includes putting the names on buildings. <laughs> so great question. I have another one. Have local building contractors been contacted about possible new housing developments? So we have consulted, uh, when I was talking about the cons consulting company that helped us with population study, they also consider um, new builds and um, uh, what's potentially on the horizon. Um, in addition, we have an additional um, real estate consultant who just actually helps us 
and um, keeps an eye on um, developments in um, the area. And so we do have frequent conversations, I actually just met with him last week about um, what's on the radar. So um, the, everything that we, um, everything anticipated it has been brought to our attention. So we know about those current projects, but as you know, things can change within a couple of years. And so we have to have those constant conversations, which is why those pauses are on the facility master plan. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, based on tier two potential, which of the options you are presenting tonight represent the least significant school changes for current students? So we're only uh, focused on these two new sites tonight and the um, schools that would be most impacted by this is it, the schools that are closest to this geography. Um, so if I'm understanding the question correctly, we when we look at um, the big scope of the picture, that's why that original timeline was created is how can we consider this with, ge with geographic um, proximities. So this is the this is the current focus. We absolutely do look though um, and have and consistently do look at our enrollment across our district and what's happening between all of our schools. This has been a very challenging year for enrollment um, across the state of Iowa. Um, so the state of Iowa has lost over 6,000 students this year due to the pandemic. And we are not alone in this from a national um, consideration. It's a bit of an anomaly for us. So it's very hard to pinpoint um, future planning of facilities based on this year's enrollment data, but we will keep that. That's absolutely the driving factor of our questions and answers of recommendations. And one last question here real quick. Uh, what's the physical distance from the micro map section you just highlighted from the Coolidge site? Is there a, a walkable option for that group at Coolidge site as opposed to J Jackson site? So what I will do is I'm going to pitch that to Scott Wing, if you wouldn't mind, Scott, and or um, Greg O'Connell and Tammy Kuba, if you wouldn't mind drilling in on that just a little bit for me. Um, and Angela, I'm not sure if you're able to as well. And then what I'll do is thread that answer back, or if you all want to throw it in the chat, that would be great. I do, I'm sorry to tell you, I don't know the footage there <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, I know it's a walkable distance as I actually think, um, I'm a West Sider. Those of you who don't know, I graduated from Jefferson. I had a friend who lived right in that neighborhood. <laughs> so I've walked to that Coolidge, um, Coolidge playground uh, before, but um, don't quite remember how long of a walk that is. So if you could um, check that out for me, that would be great. Thank you team. Green uh, the 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 distance from Coolidge over to to the park there. I think it's Jacklin Park, Cherry Hill Road. That's roughly half a mile to about six tenths of a mile. Um, they do have a very good street. Uh, excuse me, very good sidewalks there. It, it is a very good walkable option uh, for, and that's to the uh, just to pinpoint that to the eight C micro map that we originally talked about in your example. Yeah, this one right here. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Scott. I agree, Scott. There's good walkability in that little section that you were talking about. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Tammy. And I think uh, there's one other question here about talking about, I think we we may want to hold this until we get through all the options because it's talking okay. about which one actually moves the fewest students. You okay. Know, Sounds great. All right. That's great. So here you go. This is the first data set and I'll move to the next option. Great suggestion, Dave. And then we'll take um, more questions. So option two, not a significant change, but it actually alludes to the question that was just asked. So is um, still the boundary, orange boundary up here is a large portion of the current Truman enrollment headed to the north. The small 8C headed to the Coolidge site, and then still the Van Buren neighborhood and the Hoover neighborhood looking to enroll at Coolidge. And then you can see, and I'll just back up one, the difference for the site. Um, so the Coolidge site is at 489 and the previous screen is 476. Not significant, but yep, a little, a little bit of a shift. Um, and then uh, for the Jackson sites at 420 on this slide, it was 433. So still pretty well um, balanced there. 
And then you can see um, what shifts also just on the screen itself. The difference in Van Buren enrollment goes from 380 to 344, and the difference in Hoover enrollment goes from 427 to 406, which allows for a little bit of more room in those buildings. That is um, um, uh, to lose around 20 to 27 students is like a section of, of children. So just to kind of if, to give you a number or a head count. All right, next slide, option three. So um, this one is a little different. Um, we do, um, uh, again, it looks like the majority of the Truman families would be headed to the north. And then there is um, a larger section of Van Buren considered in this option as and Van Buren does show significant enrollment growth. And so uh, what we try to do is keep it close to the border of the other school. So um, that is why we went to the south here. And then also the total number of students that are within a neighborhood so that we don't take too many students out of Van Buren or Hoover um, and put too many um, into the future site. So trying to really look at this delicately, realizing that does impact, of course, um, um, family's current state. I should also clarify that the boundary implementation would happen the year after next. So this would be for the fall of 2022, when both of the new sites are open. Coolidge will not be full to capacity in its first year opening in the fall. So it will house the current Coolidge students and new Coolidge students but it would not um, be full to capacity um, until the, the following year. So that is the three options. Um, have had some feedback already with some folks saying, hey, could this option also include 8C? Um, or there was another recommendation of a little bit of a neighborhood um, up in the Truman area that could perhaps go south to Coolidge. Really great questions coming from families who live in the neighborhoods. So that's the purpose of this. We really do want to invite your feedback and input of considerations. Um, and then, of course, your considerations, we try to put that to the numbers and the guiding principles to see if it's possible. So now everybody has seen all three options, Noreen. Which option moves the fewest students from the current school community, understanding that some of them may be in a new building? So I would say um, all of Truman students will be moving. So that, um, that, that's a, um, that end will remain the same. So it would really mean um, the impact to the other schools being Hoover and Van Buren. So that would be the first two slides um, would be fewer students moving, and that would be this has a smaller section of Van Buren, and this section, a smaller section of Van Buren. Um, considering the social emotional needs of kiddos, one thing that we wanted to consider with this particular little section with 8C is we realized that the children, if they're Truman children, the, the six kids who are currently attending Truman with their friends, um, may really want to stay with their friends, um, especially if they're in third grade, and this happens in their last year of elementary school as a fifth grader, that we would grandfather or work independently with those particular circumstances, and that this may be when the building opens, it's a grandfathering in. So new kindergartners, new families, that would be um, how we would gradually re um, work with families within that 8C section. But um, so that's, I guess the numbers here tell that story, but um, the fewest number of students impacted would certainly be options one and two. How many teachers would be uh, in, at each grade level with option one? So they would be um, in the end about the same. We have built the buildings to be four section buildings. So what that means is there are four first grade teachers, there are four third grade teachers, and we also would like to dedicate full time specialists to these buildings. So that means that our teachers not split between two buildings, et cetera. So um, that would be the staffing model. And so that also means that we, um, last spring um, with Miss um, Kuba's help, we surveyed the Truman staff 
uh, to say what would be your number one preferences. So for example, it's really important that I teach first grade. You can put me wherever you want, but I really love teaching first grade. Or I have built such a partnership with my partner. We would teach at any grade level, but we've got a rhythm and we would love to be able to go together to a new environment and be on the same team together. Um, those types of feedback that we asked our staff. And then as soon as we have the boundaries done, then we'll be able to look into staffing and our recommendations for staffing and working directly with our staff on those recommendations. Uh, what's the capacity for Hoover? Um, you know, I, I need to look up my capacity um, data, but I think it's right at um, about 440. So we're right about there. <laughs> there was one question I can probably answer this one, Noreen, about uh, has anybody contacted the city about traffic patterns for Jackson families to get in and out of the school area? And um, as a part of the uh, um, uh, working with the city, with the uh, getting approvals and whatnot, we have to do uh, um, traffic counts um, um, and, and all of that with uh, and looking at this. And the city um, will uh, also recommend any updates that we may have to do with the, the, the road there on whether it's added another lane or whatever. That is something the city will uh, tell us what we need to do. And we actually have allocated funds in the budget for some upgrades that the city might make us do with regard to this project, depending on the traffic counts and, and the traffic studies that's being done. And uh, a lot of questions here, but we probably uh, starting to come in here, Noreen. So I, I think you probably want to get going through some of your. So I, I will say that I, there are some of these that we can certainly um, answer. Um, so um, the thought process of adding the additional section of Van Buren it is literally their, their enrollment is increasing and they need more room. <laughs> Um, and so, and then we also wanted to use the geographic locations that were closest to the new site. Um, it was really, a, and then, then the number of students within each one of those neighborhoods um, using those guiding principles. So that was that um, thought process. Um, the furthest point of um, a student attending a new school. Um, so if we look at each one of those um, three options, I think that it would matter, let's just use Truman as an example, the furthest west and south point to get to Jackson would be a distance. So uh, just for a, uh, just, you know, district um, wide, we use a two mile rule for uh, transportation currently that we bus students who are greater than two miles, but we have other options in which we provide transportation. And Scott, do you just want to kind of quick overview of how we provide additional transportation to families? So on offering transportation, like Noreen said, anything more than two miles, free transportation is offered and it, you know, students are eligible if they live more than two miles from the school. Other options inside of the two mile radius are if we've deemed that the area is unsafe to walk to school or some other hazards exist, we offer an option called paid busing uh, or tuition based busing. And uh, those are, we would have bus stops available for neighborhoods that uh, people want to catch the bus um, into their school. Um, th those are some of the options there, Noreen. Thank you, Scott. Um, thank you for some of the input and feedback too of considerations. We will be recording the chat and then we're also gonna offer a survey to get that input for your ideas of please consider or, or think about. So thank you for those offerings. Um, and then there was um, one additional question I wanted to respond to here. about permits. So what if, what if students want to permit to the new sites? First and foremost, our Truman families have to get priority and the Hoover families have to get priority and the Van Buren families have to get priority for the new site. Then we would go through our permit process. Um, Eric Christensen, give a wave. Eric Christensen is our executive of elementary. At the elementary level, he oversees that process and can explain what that process looks like. 
It would not be a given that we could have that happen right away. We certainly have to make sure that the neighborhood families have access um, first but we would consider the 120 plus current Truman families working individually with them because they're, they are no longer able to choose Truman as their option. And we would wanna work individually with them as what, what they would like to do. Um, also, there was a question here about um, the Hoover apartment complex. The boundary does include an entire apartment complex. Um, it's not splitting an apartment complex, although there's a series of apartment complexes over there um, as well. The one that's highlighted is one that we anticipate will continue to have some growth as well. Um, so, uh, Eric, do you want to clarify anything about permits or permit process? No, I think you nailed it, Noreen. It's just um, when <clears throat> I'll just share with the group that when a parent does apply for a permit, um, I work with John Rice in the teaching and learning department. Um, we do have some criteria that John follows, and then I follow up with the appeals. So we work with families pretty close in that and talk about different situations. Um, there's another question, too, about uh, the concern of um, uh, the support that um, families will need. So I'll just use Hoover as an example, community school, very targeted to support English language learning students. Um, we've learned a lot in the past several years of how to best support them. We share those practices across our buildings. And so um, if English, what very may will happen in the next five to 10 years is every single building in Cedar Rapids has an English language learning program. And we will need to share best practices um, so that our families can go to their neighborhood schools and also receive services. So that's what we will do is make sure that those services exist in our buildings. Okay, so I do wanna give an opportunity for, for you to have feedback. So what I'm going to do is share this with everyone in the chat. There is a link to a Google form and it allows you to um, rank um, your preferences for each one of the options being that's very preferable or not preferable at all. You can actually give each option the same ranking if you so choose, but there's another question that actually asks you to ask for your first, second, and third choices. If you only have one choice and say, this is the only one I think that's a good idea, you can actually mark no preference on the other choices. And then there's just open-ended feedback comments that we would like to gather from you so that we can consider our next steps. Um, the question, there was uh, some additional questions too about special programming. Um, that is all considered in the data that we have for every single student. So whether that be a student who qualifies for an accommodation plan or what's called a 504 plan, students who qualify for special education services, students who qualify for perhaps Title I reading services, all of those services are considered and our greatest hope is that we provide every single one of those services in every single one of our buildings so our children can stay in their neighborhood schools and get access to the services that they need. So um, we will be, we do know this, there's currently a special education program in Truman um, that um, Ms. Kuba has led and worked so closely with we did design the Coolidge building to accommodate that very specific program um, for students who have very specific needs, especially um, um, adaptation needs, physical adaptation needs. So we designed specifically at Coolidge for that program. That program will transfer to Coolidge um, as soon as it opens. And then, um, uh, and then Jackson will also have um, special education programming. So this, the numbers on the screen include all students, uh, every single student, every single program that's, that's offered. So great questions around that. So I do wanna apologize if you didn't get your question answered in the chat. What I will do is I will record um, the chat, um, uh, copy and paste all the questions. Um, most of your names are on those questions. We have your emails and our team will work very hard to answer your individual questions. And please do not hesitate to reach out to me directly, Eric Christensen, our principals, um, Mr. Nicholson, Mr. Wing. We, we will do our very best to help manage this process. And 
Um, I talked a lot about data tonight. Um, that it, that's helpful for us to make decisions. But again, I just want to recognize that this is a real deal for families. Um, and it's there's an emotional um, component to this, maybe the largest component to this. And we recognize that this is also challenging, exciting, but also challenging. And um, thank you. Thank you so much um, for your commitment to being here tonight. And uh, we would invite um, future conversations if this would be helpful um, for others. Going to do a couple PTA meetings. We have one scheduled at Truman coming up. Um, Ms. Kuba, which date is that? February, February 11th? Tuesday, February 9th. February 9th, okay. Yep, so we will make sure that we keep um, pushing out information and definitely want to um, support questions. And, and I just wanna give a shout out. Our families are incredible. You are amazing, wonderful people and we um, love serving you and your children. Uh, uh, however, I'll also say this, we have the best staff. I'll, I've worked in a lot of districts and we have amazing, amazing staff members. And so a special shout out to them in helping manage this process as well. So thank you all for being here. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have additional questions. We wanna be mindful of your time. We're three minutes over and I apologize for that. Um, um, we'll send out the PowerPoint and again, would invite um, additional questions. So thank you for being here tonight. You are dismissed. <laughs> class dismissed.